a conversation that started last week. We had uh, Peter in Tamburskloof. He lives on the slopes of Table Mountain and he says he's worried about the number of people that he sees um, up on the mountain and harvesting indigenous plants largely used in indigenous uh, traditional medicine. I'm talking about buchu, I'm talking about kohut. That he says he sees many people with bags and bags of goods up on Table Mountain and simply taking unabated. Um, there is this constant uh, contestation between protecting conservation areas but also accepting that people have become very much in tune with indigenous knowledge systems and using traditional plants and herbs in their daily regimens. We can't also ignore that there is also some commercial aspect to that. So we thought we invite um, Ralph, who is a, a farm out in the Woolsley area. Rupert Quirpman is a botanist. We're also going to be speaking to the Friends of Table Mountain on the line with us. Uh, Rupert, I'll start with you this morning and good morning to all of you. Um, what are your thoughts as a botanist that has worked on Table Mountain, that has worked in various uh, sensitive ecosystems and conservation areas about this balance between allowing people to practice traditional tradition versus the conservation element? It's pretty much this uh, balance um, of access versus um, the amount of material that gets used versus the amount of people that we are. So, um, uh, and and I want us to explode this thing up a bit because at the moment it's just like, you know, picking bad. And there are certain categories where that definitely is the case. So you want your, um, your slower growing things like the your trees, for example, big bulbs like um, the bullfone, um, where the, the outer scales get used. These are things that take 50 to 100 plus years to, to, to grow. Then you've got your, your you mentioned koehut. Koehut is a, a really easy growing plant. There's lots of it. You can harvest it almost as much as you want without much impact. And then you've got your in-betweens such as buchu. You can't harvest it every year and as, as much as you want to. I know as, as an ex-official that there's definitely space within the various protected area management plans, um, as well as the mandates of, of um, a sandbox, a Cape Nature and so forth, to allow for sustainable harvesting. So we're never going to get to a point where sustainable harvesting is not a thing. Um, what then becomes the challenge is... Um, as usual resources. So uh, you need a, a management plan for the particular resource. Um, and to be honest, for quite a few of the resources, mm. we actually don't know how much harvesting they mm. can take. Um, and, and that was our constant challenge back in the day when I was mm. working at Cape Nature. We get an application for um, a nature reserve and then it's the uh, they're looking for resource X and then you go to the literature and resource X doesn't have you know, it takes three years for this thing to recover. So um, that information gap is, is is a big issue. And ultimately, you want to be meeting most of this demand by cultivation because our protected area management plans have got a certain outcome that mm -hmm. they need to reach, which is the perpetuation of material um, to be used into the future. Uh, and then you, you need to have a space where you've got almost sacrificial areas which can be harvested quite heavily mm. to a commercial point of view. Let me cross now to uh, Willem Bosov. He's the founder of the Newlands uh, Co uh, Forest Conservation Group. When we talk about people um, harvesting, whether it be bulbs, whether it be roots, whether it be um, kohut or buchu, or maybe even the issue of bark stripping that we've encountered over the last while, how has the, the, the issue come into the conversation? There's talk of increased number of bark stripping, particularly in the Newland Cecilia Forest area. Your experience, Willem? Uh, yes, we currently have what can only be described as an epidemic of, of bark stripping. Uh, bark stripping has happened in the Newlands Forest area um, since the, the early 90s. 
uh, to my knowledge, probably long before that. Um, but since COVID with the lockdown, we've seen an enormous increase in box stripping. Uh, it's happening at a commercial level. Uh, we see syndicates coming out, stripping 10, 15 trees at a night. Um, mature trees, it's uh, Cape Beach, Asahai, uh, Cape Holly. Uh, there are very few stinkwoods left. Um, and, and so the, the damage that's being done at this point in time is enormous. And it's a very, very big concern for us. So there is the concern that being more than a traditional practice or religious practice, a commercial practice of the illicit economy growing to the extent that it includes uh, indigenous plant species and the box of trees, Willem? Without a doubt. I mean, the guys that's harvesting here are not harvesting for themselves. They're harvesting to sell on in bulk to intermediaries. Uh, Sandpox has arrested uh, three people. I, rem- I think it was not the year before last, 2021. Um, they had 60 kilograms of bark on them. Uh, we, like I say, we go. I, yesterday I went into the forest. I got a tip off from one of the rangers and found 10 trees that were bark stripped in a single night. Uh, we, you know, that would be they're probably filling about uh, four or five uh, large uh, refuse bags with with bark, um, and that that happens now on a weekly basis. Mm. So uh, we we know that the, some of the bark's being exported to other parts of the country where trees are stripped out, mm. uh, but this is for profit eco side. Mm. Rupert, very quickly, what is the commercial value of stripping bark in Newlands Forest? on a commercial scale. Willem's mentioned several species there. So um, we've also got the, the issue in the suburbs of camphor trees and oracaria being stripped out. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, those are, are more to do with respiratory kind of medicines. Um, and uh, as Francho Krieger of uh, Krieger Trees says, um, you can get your camphor from clicks, you know, mm-hmm. in the form of Zambuck and Vix. Um, so that's actually a, a use where there's already a commercial output. Um, the other um, things like the black stinkwood, which uh, Willem men- mentioned, is pretty much almost locally extinct now. Um, and there is going to have to be some sort of massive intervention. Um, up north, we've got the issue of um, the pepper bark, Walburgia w- salutaris, which um, is very heavily harvested. But also, there is a program with Sandbox, Sandby, and a lot of other partners to produce them commercially and give it to herbalists. So that is, is a way of... of um, kind of intervening but down here remember our forests are kind of we, we're at the edge of forest um, natural habitat so um, they're kind of on the edge mm. here so we're not going to have a lot of explosion of forest so the the way of meeting that demand is going to mm. be quite different it'll have to be urban forestry and and all the rest of it mm. um so I don't have a value thing because it depends on on basically what the mm. end user is prepared to pay. So that could be through mm. a herbalist, through a retailer, or straight to mm. to the user. Ralph is a farmer in Woolsey uh, who grows buchu naturally. They have a permit from Cape Nature to harvest. But despite your efforts to be a sustainable buchu farmer, Ralph, you're saying that the are poachers who particularly target something that grows quite naturally and freely in parts of the southwestern Cape, and, and, and that is Buchu. What's your experience? Uh, thanks, Lester. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we've been farming Buchu for 20-odd years, maybe longer. It, it grows naturally in a very specific habitat. As we know, it's, uh, it's indigenous to the Western Cape. You have two varieties, the Langblad and the Rondeblad. Uh, you can go into the more technical names. And um, we've, we, we generally harvest every second year. So we allow the plants to then recover. And then we cut uh, or harvest again. And uh, we do it sustainably. Now, how do you gauge sustainability? Well, you would, you would cut only certain types or certain parts of the, of the, of the bush so that you have the growth points still remaining and you're actually helping the plant to get, um, you know, to, to grow better. So when it comes to sustainability, we try and ensure that the, that the, that the plants continue growing and they continue growing healthily. Mm. But when the poaching occurs, um, 
they just willy-nilly come and they start cutting. They even rip young plants with roots and all out of the ground. And for want of a better explanation, they they are stealing to not steal again. Mm. They are uh, steal on cloud to steal mm. for want of a better English English wording. With very little knowledge of this particular aspect of our economy, but also what I'm cottoning on the illicit economy, something like 95 rand a kilogram for the um, buku that's illegally harvested. How much are they getting yeah. away with at a time? Lester, you, you, I'm glad you're sitting down. I did a, a, a quick sum last year when, we, when, when the poaching escalated tremendously in our area. Um, so I, we had a poacher. He had a license to cut buhu from a neighbor. And this is how the motors operandi work. So they will get a, a permit and they will get a contract with the farmer. And that is their gateway to uh, to to neighboring buhu and also Cape Nature's buhu. Mm. And they would then use that farm as the legitimate entry point and exit point, And they would bring in their teams. So we would have a individual come in on the morning with, say, 12 to 14 uh, guys on the back. And they would spend the whole day until well, more or less sunset picking buhu. Mm. And then they would make their way down, and then the 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 let's call it the 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 guy that arranges everything. He would then come in, and he would get the bags of buhu. Now mm. I have sent pictures of the one hall that we that we found. Um, I think it was about twelve or fourteen bags of buhu. Um, these are these little Hessian bag, well mm. Hessian bags, the 40, 50 kilogram Hessian bags, and. You can work on about 40 kilograms of buhu in one bag. So do the maths. It's about 3,000. It's 40 kilograms times by 12, 480 kilograms times by, let's call it 100 rand. Gosh. So look, 95 per kilogram times 40, that's about 3,800 rand a bag. You times that by 12 and my mathematics is not well at the moment to to to, to calculate yeah, that but, only, but 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 three thousand eight right it's 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 a hundred thousand rand um illicit economy that could go into the multi-millions rupert it, let's it talk does. about let's talk about some of of, of the response it clearly is an illicit commercial activity on an industrial scale that 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 ralph describes but also, how would a law enforcement approach impact on a person or a community who does it for traditional, cultural, um, religious reasons? Maybe even if you were to go to the station deck, you'd find members of the Rastafarian community selling bulbs and, and herbs. I wouldn't argue on an industrial scale, but on a scale for them, it's what they make the, the daily bread with how would a fierce or a strong law enforcement response affect those people who are harvesting for whatever traditional or cultural reason? Uh, again, we've got to strip out the industrial versus the subsistence because um, the reason why Ralph, and you can take it to the succulents, Perla Moon, etc., um, is because all these natural resources over time have been seen as a less important law enforcement thing. So um, you go to court, I've sat in court um, one needing to testify for a case and people just don't arrive and all the rest of it. So if there's no consequences for green law enforcement thing, then you develop a, a, a case law or lack thereof where there are no consequences, which means whether you're uh, poaching flowers, buhu, whatever, um, that needs to be policed much better. And, and at the moment, it's seen as a green thing, which is over here somewhere. And you have your normal law enforcement on the side. What we fail to realize that all illicit black market yeah. activity is connected, whether it be rhino horn, uh, illegal exactly. um, uh, uh, sex work, or whether it be drugs or even buhu, they're all connected in the yeah, same they, economy. They in, Unfortunately, you you need a strong specialist aspect there 
um, because what's happening in, in uh, the succulent poaching, for example, is that we're having to train magistrates from scratch, that this is actually something which requires um, intervention and the proper fines and, and all the rest of it. And I would argue that a green court, like we used to have for, for Perla Moon, essentially, mm. is, is the way forward, because these numbers are not insignificant that, that Ralph's talking about you mm. took in the succulents as well. We're talking about millions of rands worth of, of stuff here, which is now seen as a kind of, it's leaking out of the mm. economy. With your, your rasters on the station deck and so forth, that's always going to be a thing, because uh, uh, the formal conservation agencies are willing to engage with formal bodies. Um, mm. So, uh, in, in Paul, there are definitely groups of Rastafarians who have got agreements with the various agencies and so forth. So it's not impossible. People are not out there in bad faith, not wanting to, to sign agreements and so forth. The key is that positive law enforcement. Make sure that when Ralph reports it to his local police station, it's not like, oh, now, you know, back to the back of the queue. <laughs> it's it's okay this is something that which needs happening it's it's the same with uh film in the table mountain fun thing so um sandbox wanting needing to do law enforcement when they don't necessarily always have mm. the law enforcement um capabilities to do the arrests and so forth and then just constantly working on the alternative where is their land which is well located where we can do the um planting of the medicinal and give people access to um and that's something we're always going to be pitching mm. at from a positive point of view from from various places mm. where i'm involved unfortunately we have to leave it there we're eating into eyewitness news we're eating into the rest of the show but willem ralph rupert really appreciate your time